Delighted to be back in Yorkshire. I spend a lot of time here. Um, I'm very, very glad to. Uh, as Mike said, I want to talk a little bit about Brexit specifically this evening. And because I think the next six months or so are going to be, as Mike said, historic. We have a, we're going into an era now, and I think it starts now, with this new parliament that uh, came back from recess yesterday. I think it starts now. And the next six months of parliamentary debate and discussion, I assume, will be dominated by this issue. We are, of course, due to leave in March 2019. I'm not entirely convinced that we will. Uh, certainly not in any true respect. We may get something resembling a so-called Brexit, but I doubt very much if by next March the what has taken two years and gotten really nowhere uh, will all be sorted out by next March. But I'm going to do a series of talks during this month, which we've called Brexit Month. And to, I'm going to tackle different aspects of this debate. And of course, each one will be recorded and put up on the website, and I'll be asking people to share them. What I want to do really is talk a bit in depth, because I, I, I'm critical always of the lack of scope in how we talk about the EU. I think it is trade deals, of course, are vital. But there is more to it than that. There is a, you know, we've, it was sold to us, the EU was sold to us back in, uh, several, uh, back in the 70s as an economic model. And indeed it did sort of trap countries into an eco economic model. But always with the intention of being a political union. Always with the intention. And the idea of European union, unity is a very, very old one. Uh, and there have been many attempts made to unify Europe several times over centuries. And it was, it was Victor Hugo who first used the term United States of Europe back in 1849. And even Hitler sought a pan-Europe domination, led, of course, by Germany. And he lost the war, but I don't necessarily think that his ideas were defeated. Seen as the, the first step, let's go back a little bit. I want to talk this evening about the EU itself, how it works, and what it actually is, and what it was always intended to be. So going back to the first steps of this attempt to create a United States of Europe was, of course, the European Coal and Steel Community, which was signed with the Treaty of Paris in 1951 and included Belgium, France, which was West Germany at the time, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, and Italy. And the idea floated at that time, of course, was to merge coal and steel, which people, which were seen as vital in the waging of war. And if they could merge the markets on this, no country would be able to secretly build up weapons for war. And this would bring peace. They'd, they saw it as the merging of these markets making war immaterially impossible, or materially impossible. So the new union, that coal and steel union, uh, was designed to prevent war, at least that was its aim. Uh, and as it developed, the ideas that we would prevent war was that the nation developed into the nation state itself must be opposed. Because after the war, it was deemed that nationalism had been the cause of the war and that the nation states therefore had to go. And we can hear this rhetoric. I'll give you a couple of minutes to sit down. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. So the... In order to build a federal superstate, of course, you have to demonize and condemn nationalism itself, and with it, the very concept of the nation state. And you hear this, this is the rhetoric that we're hearing today, that nationalism is dangerous. The EU leaders tell us this all the time. We've got to start moving away from nationalism. And national leaders also say the same. Emmanuel Macron, for example, warned recently against what he called the retreat into nationalism and condemned what he called the illiberal democracies. He described national sovereignty as a game of fools. Now, such a demonization of nationalists in Europe has led us to be called far right. And this is a phrase that invokes, for most people, images of Nazis 
of uh, racist skinheads, uh, of neo-Nazis. But the irony, of course, being that the Nazis actually also believed in a unified Europe. Now, if you don't believe in a unified Europe, you will be labelled a Nazi. Uh, moving forward, then we come to the Treaty of Rome, which was signed in 1957. And this created the European Economic Community. Now, we can see with the naming of this what the, the drawing was going to be. It was going to be all about economics. It was going to be sold as, an, as ev of economic benefit to the member states. And it was going to entwine member states into an economy that they would find it extremely difficult to get out of. Once inside, the political union began. Uh, it also created the customs union. And we're still arguing about this customs union, of course, today. And a precondition of the customs union is that the European Commission negotiates for and on behalf of the union as a whole in international trade deals. This is why we're arguing so much about the customs union. Because it doesn't allow, staying in it, doesn't allow Britain to make its own trade deals. This is the point. And yet you rarely hear this being pointed out. The Remain politicians will argue that we must stay in the customs union, as if that's some sort of compromise on leaving the European Union. It's not. It means we can't trade with the world as and on our own terms. That's not leaving the European Union. That's the European Union continuing to speak on our behalf. And it tells us a lot, actually, about the politicians who are arguing to stay in the customs union. It will, of course, effectively keep us in the European Union. And it's important to know and to state over and over again that the idea of this is to rid us of sovereignty. Pieces of sovereignty one bit at a time. If you can't make your own trade deals, you are not a sovereign country. Now, the customs union also, of course, applies common tariffs for goods outside, arriving from outside the EU. Throughout the 60s and 70s, the EEC, as it was, began to grow and encompass more and more countries. Denmark joined, Ireland joined, the UK joined following a referendum, uh, promising membership, once again, of a single market, uh, not a political union. Norway applied to join during this period, but its people rejected it in a referendum. How lucky they were. Uh, mind you, they still, of course, have a lot of... Uh, obedience to the European Union in order to, to, to carry out. So in 1979, the first elections to the new European Parliament were made. And I'll get back to the European Parliament in a minute. In the 80s, continued to grow and grow and grow. Spain and Portugal joined and the Schengen Agreement was uh, created, which would do something absolutely vital. And whilst we're not a member, uh, what it would do was create what we today see as one of the EU's red lines, free movement of people. And that remains one of the EU's red lines in their negotiations with us to try and escape this. And it was also in the 1980s that the European flag began to fly and the, European, the single European Act was signed creating the single market in Europe. And the single mar market is, of course, distinct from the customs union in that it introduced free movement of goods, services, services capital and, crucially, people. It also got rid of non-tariff barriers and created uniformity in terms of packaging and safety standards. In the 1990s came the Maastricht Treaty. Now, this changed the European economic community into the European community, dropping the facade that this was any more going to be about economics. This was now blatantly becoming a United States of Europe. It was blatantly on its way to doing so. It, at that time, around that time, Austria, Sweden and Finland also joined. In 2002, the juggernaut towards the United States of Europe continued and the euro became currency in 19 countries across the continent. Trajectory for federal Europe, once again, continuing its path in 2004. The empire, which is what it is, now included Cyprus, the Czech Republic, Estonia, Hungary, Latvia, Lithuania, Malta, Poland, Slovakia and Slovenia. Next, then, in the series, long series of treaties, all of them 
leading towards greater integration and all of them leading towards a United States of Europe. The Lisbon Treaty, by the way, was voted down by Ireland, who was forced to vote again. And it's, again, we now have a flag. We now have dropping of the economic from the name of the organisation. And with the Lisbon Treaty, we got a president, a president of the European Council, and a person who is not, as should come as no surprise to any of us, elected by the people. So the structure and functioning of the EU, uh, legislation, primarily taking the forms of directives, which are an order to the nation state to legislate internally, to put into effect whatever the directive requires, our regulations, which are set out and immediately become binding across the nation or across the member states. The bodies that make it up, it's way too boring to go into them in any great detail, but the bodies that make it up and the main ones are the European Council, which sets the political direction of the European <coughs> Union. And we already know what the political direction of the European Union is. The European Commission, now this is the real powerhouse of the European Union. It is known or calls itself the guardian of the treaties. And it, what, effectively, what effectively it is, is the executive. So it would be the equivalent of the government, whoever occupies Downing Street. You've also, of course, got the Council of the European Union, which is an executive of ministers from across member states. The European Parliament, which is the only directly, directly elected um, part of the machinery of the European Union with 751 representatives. Very, very few teeth, though. Uh, and if you are a cynical person when it comes to the EU, I certainly am, you might believe that the European Parliament is something of window dressing, something to allow us to believe that the European Union is actually a dem democratic body. But in effect and in practice, the European Parliament has very little power uh, and certainly it exercises very little power. And the Commission is the proposer of legislation. So this is why I said that this is the actual powerhouse. They are the ones who come up with the ideas. They put this into the Parliament, certainly, to be debated and they can make amendments and what have you. Uh, but in practice, the Commission is not to be disobeyed and will only really remove things it didn't particularly care about anyway, if the Parliament requests it. And it's not unheard of for them to simply send back the same piece of legislation, only written differently, because it gets its own way. That is the nature of the thing. The European Court of Justice is the, is, it's a, it's a, its decisions are binding. It handles disputes between member states or disputes between the European Union and a member state. And its decisions are binding across the European Union. So it's a very, very powerful body. And it has several methods of interpretation at its disposal. And it almost always uses the, what is known as the purpose of interpretation which is to interpret legislation for a purpose, with an overwhelming purpose in mind. And it always, I'll go out on a limb and say always, interprets laws to further the integration of the European nation states. And again, the trajectory towards the European federal super state continues through all of these very, very powerful bodies. So what does all of this mean? It means that quite obviously, that a federal Europe is on the cards and was always on the cards. And it is the latest attempt to bring that into being. And of course, rather than announce itself as a European, as a path to European federation, it began as an economic model, duping, almost, duping the member states and duping the people of member states to believe that that's what it was. Now, the political union which it has developed into has, as I mentioned, red lines. And crucial, the most crucial one. And this is why I say I don't believe that next March we're going to get what we voted for. Because they will, our government will find a way of keeping the borders open and call, telling us that they haven't. 
It's already happening, in fact. I think we heard some, some phrase that Theresa May had made up after the Chequers arrangement, that it would not be called freedom of movement anymore, but that it would mean that anyone from the European Union can come and live and work in the UK. So what they'll do is simply rephrase everything. A bit like what the European Union does when it has its legislation questioned by the Parliament. It rephrases it and sends it back. Like it did, actually, with the referendum on the Lisbon Treaty in Ireland as well. Rephrased it a little bit. Of course, spent uh, tens of millions of pounds on, or euros on propaganda, trying to frighten people into voting. And they did, unfortunately. Voted the way they were told. So why is open borders so important? Because it dismantles the nation state. It's as simple as that. It is destructive to the, this, this attack on the nation state is not only to dismantle it, it is to, to dilute, of course, internal cultures through mass immigration. And that's not necessarily the mass immigration inside of Europe that will dilute European culture, although national cultures will take a hitting. It is the immigration from outside that is destabilizing the European Union, that is destabilizing European countries, that is bringing crime and mayhem to the streets of Europe, and is aimed at undermining. Because whenever there's a problem, you can see this all the time, and whenever there's a problem, if people get killed in the streets, as they have done, because the EU has brought with it, has brought bloodshed and mayhem to the streets of Europe. But even when that happens, the immediate response, both of national governments of member states and of the European Union, is to worry about our opinion on their open borders. The actual murder of people doesn't matter. What they do is go into overdrive to try and control our reaction to it. Once again, you can see this happening in Germany just this weekend. German people in Chemnitz had decided they'd had enough. Tens of thousands of them if the pictures and the independent media is to be believed, have been marching through the streets in protest at the murder and rape of German people by migrants, holding up, very movingly, holding up pictures of people who have been murdered by migrants. And the mayor of that city now, only now, has she declared a state of emergency. So we don't get states of emergency when people are being blown up at Christmas markets. And we don't get states of emergency when 2,000 men descend on Cologne Square and assault around 1,000 women, some of whom were gang raped. Uh, and then of course the media pretended the next day that nothing had happened. Uh, this is, th their concern is always our reaction. And they've made it clear, not only with the fact that they always respond in the same way, which is to control our opinion, and to make sure that we're not allowed to express any negative opinions about this. Or to make sure we're not allowed to express dissent from the open borders and this madness that they are inflicting on us. That's the priority. They have made it very, very clear that no matter how much murder and mayhem is brought to the streets of Europe, the EU has no intention at all of closing the external border of this continent. None whatsoever. They have told us that that is what they intend to do, is to keep it open, and that it doesn't matter how many people are killed or abused or assaulted in the street. This is what we must tell the British people. If we are going to keep public opinion strong and robust against this monster in Brussels, only public opinion is going to get us out of the European Union. And it's being chipped away at, very deliberately so. You can see, you can hear it in the hints that are being dropped. They're dropping hints into public discourse. This people's vote that we've got is an extraordinary act in Orwellian deception. Uh, and it is. It's the down is the new up world that we live in. History is being rewritten. We know this. Because we know that after the referendum result came through, almost immediately they began to say, but they, but they didn't vote for hard Brexit. People, and you will hear the exact, the exact words of politicians, even those, uh, and I should say actually, I, I criticise a lot uh, Remain MPs representing uh, Leave constituencies. And I was in the North East recently and spoke about this, that all of the Labour MPs in that region uh, are Leave, or are Remainers. 
and are leading Leave constituencies. And all of them have made some sort of noise about how the people got it wrong, how they, and the exact words, the exact words, well, yes, they voted for Brexit, but they didn't vote for this Brexit. And this is what we're hearing all the time. We didn't know what we were voting for. There's a very, very, very powerful message in that. If your government is telling you we're going to ignore what you voted for in good faith, we told you beforehand that we would follow through, that we would take, your, take the result and implement it, uh, but now they're telling you, actually, you know what, we think you got this wrong and we're, not, we're going to find a way out of it. When your government is telling you that, you have to take, you have to listen. You have to take the message that's being sent to you. And the message sent to you is, that's it, it's over. Your vote doesn't matter anymore. We know best. But on the, on the issue of Remain MPs, the, the idea that a Remain MP should say to, her, to his or her own constituents, you made the wrong decision, I know best, and you didn't vote for this Brexit. It should also, even if even MPs in constituencies that voted to Remain must also go along with leave. The country as a whole voted to leave and the MPs should be respecting that, whether or not they themselves believe in remain or leave or whether or not their constituency voted to remain or leave. The country voted, it must be respected. But we know that the European Union does not like to respect these things and it would have been far too much, far too blatant, if you like, for them to just ignore Brexit. It was too big. It was the UK voting to leave the EU. It was far too big to ignore in the way that they've ignored referenda on other issues. So instead, we'll drag it out and drag it out and drag it out and make it look extremely difficult, which is bizarre because it isn't difficult at all for the European Union to, side, to sign the biggest trade deal in the world, which it signed recently with Japan, and all without demanding open borders from Japan all without demanding punishment of Japan's working class people, and all without demanding that, the, that Japan completely dilute and destroy its culture. So why is it that the EU can make trade deals with a completely different culture, a completely different country on the other side of the world, but finds it so difficult and so complex to make a trade deal with a country right on its doorstep? It's punitive. It is showing its nature. So we have to look at the bigger picture in all of this. We do need to look at the big, bigger picture. And what it amounts to, this demonization of, of nation state, the demonization of people who believe in the nation state or who fight for the nation state, who are dismissed as hateful and bigots, is actually edit, heading towards criminalization of dissent from open border policies. What they will do and what they have done is Label it all hate. If you object, you're full of hate. So the first thing to do is call objections to their open border policies hate or racism or far right. The second thing to do then is to criminalise hate and racism and far right. And they will get to decide, of course, what constitutes hate and racism and far right. It is the criminalisation of opinion that criticizes their policies. And you can see this happening in Germany, where people have actually been taken to court for Facebook posts on criminal charges, for Facebook posts criticizing Merkel's open border policy. We need to understand the seriousness of that. We really do. And I think our freedoms and our authority, our authority as the electorate, has been so gradually taken away from us that we no longer see ourselves as having that authority. So it works. That's exactly the idea. So we don't see ourselves as the power that we are. And then we forget that actually, come election time, the choice is in our hands. They don't want us to believe that. They don't want us to feel that power. And what all of this amounts to is totalitarianism. That is the definition of totalitarianism. And the EU is a power structure. It's an empire and it's dominated by personalities who exhibit nothing less than disgust at what it considers to be intransigence. It uses explicit threats to evoke obedience, and it has shown, repeatedly shown disdain for the democratic mandate of the majority. Now, since the British people voted to leave the EU, this ugly characteristic 
has made itself ever more apparent. So what is the future? Well, it will be continue. We can look at the past and predict what the future, at least the direction. We can take some guess, a very educated guess, I would, I would expect, what the future will be unless drastic change happens now. The dismantling of the European nation state into regions of a federal superstate will continue and we will be led by a remote and unaccountable governance and the people will be con continue to be presented with a facade and the EU will continue to use words like democracy and rights while continuing to snuff them out and ironically such is the rot in all of this so deep has the rot set in that the EU was awarded a Nobel Peace Prize partly for its promotion of democracy while simultaneously flexing its muscles in opposition to the results of democratic votes. This is the world that we're living in and it's, the future is totalitarianism in its purest form. Our opinions, our speech, our lives will be utterly dominated in all aspects. And if we disagree with centralised bureaucratic governance, we will go to jail. I have no doubt whatsoever. It is already happening. And I, we will descend into a USSR-like socialist corporate hybrid uh, where citizenship is replaced by serfdom. Now, I believe that we have to stop that future from occurring. I think we have a duty to stop that future from occurring. And it will occur. And the first step to bringing about this demise, the, the fight back against that kind of future, the fight back for the next generation and the generation after that, starts with our robust pursuit of Brexit. It's, as I said, I don't believe that we will get what we voted for. And I believe that the British government will rename things and simply sell it to us as something else. But insist on Brexit, we must. And only public opinion is going to bring it about. So I believe we must make sure that public opinion is as informed as it can possibly be, with as many details, as many aspects of the debate on the European Union as we can possibly have. It's not about solely about economics. Of course, this is vital. I'm not in any way suggesting it isn't. But if we have to talk about the social consequences, the consequences for our daily lives, the dismantling of our identity, the dismantling of our race, the destruction of our self-confidence. The Conservative Party now, to my view, rests on how it's going to handle Brexit. And I think how it, handled Bre how it handles Brexit will determine its future for some years to come. If, as many suspect, including myself, there is a leadership challenge in the Conservative Party. And if a Brexiteer wins that leadership, I think they too will find themselves on the end of the EU's threats. And I'm not sure how they will respond. I'm not entirely convinced that there's anyone on the Conservative front bench at this time who will do what needs to be done. There are some who, of course, I would have more faith in than others, but they will not stop threatening and bullying. And no Prime Minister wants to be the Prime Minister who, leads, who, who presides over the loss of potentially tens of thousands of jobs. No Prime Minister wants to be blamed for that. This is very, very difficult. And it's very, very difficult because the EU is punishing us and making it very, very difficult. But if, if there is a Brexiteer Prime Minister by virtue of a Conservative Party leadership context, I don't think they will be pro-Brexit enough. What's needed is a clear insistence, a clear insistence, tough and clear, that open borders will not be entertained. The EU should be called out for what it is and labelled what it is, and the British people warned of the future if they do not break free from this tyranny now. But breaking free from it is not going to be enough. The UK has set in motion the 
saving of Europe. And I suspect the UK will be called on to save the continent once again. Even if we did, the reason I say that Brexit of itself is not enough, even if we did get a Brexit that we voted for, even if by some miracle next March the UK has complete control over its borders, complete control over its fishing waters, complete control over its ability to enter trade deals of its own volition and on its own terms. Even if this is an, an, an enormous task, an enormous task, and if they haven't done it in two years, I don't know how they're going to do it in six months. But even if that happens, what's the future then? If we get Brexit, what's the future then? We have to look to Switzerland for an idea. It's the perfect example, and I think we need to raise it over and over again. Switzerland is, as we know, a, a very democratic society, a very democratically minded society. The Swiss people are very authoritative. They, have, they, they get, get and demand referenda on all sorts. It's a very referendum-based society. And they did, some years ago, vote in a referendum to reduce immigration into their country. The EU didn't like this. Uh, remember, Switzerland is not a member of the European Union. The EU did not like the Swiss people voting for a limit to the number of people allowed to enter the, and live in their country and punished them for it. So it continues to, it punishes countries even outside of its authority if that country dares to put a spanner in the works of the European federal superstate. You're allowed, Switzerland is allowed to stay outside of the EU, but only upon condition that it obeys anyway. This is obvious. The European Union decided to put sanctions on Switzerland, economic sanctions, trade sanctions, again, threatening all tens of thousands of people will be unemployed. You better do what we say. And it, the Swiss government held out for a couple of years before capitulating. And the referendum that the Swiss people, again, in good faith, had voted in, thinking that their voice would be heard, thinking that if we vote... You can imagine the campaigning that went on. There was campaigning that went on, on both sides. Of course, the people campaigning for the less immigration side were called racists and Nazis and all the rest of it by the European Union. But even outside the EU, if you don't obey you will be punished. The same will happen if we get even the fullest of full Brexits. The same will happen. They will make it as difficult as possible and they will continue to punish time after time after time. The Remain MPs here will grab on to every bit of difficulty that the EU throws at us and will use it as an excuse and a reason to stop this because it's going to take time. It's going to take time to, to uh, re-legislate or to, to get rid of some laws and, and keep others. The whole thing is going to take time. And within that time, there will be a, an enormous push to just scrap the whole thing. And that is already being floated. This, there's a psychological trickery going on here of putting out the idea that we don't actually have to do this. And the European Union is doing that more and more. The UK is welcome to stay in the European Union, is now what's being floated. You can always change your mind. And then, of course, we have this people's vote. The people who are pushing this um, are extremely devious. Extremely, extremely devious. And I don't hear it. I don't hear it. Occasionally, you might get someone interviewed, a commentator, for example, might be on Sky News or as, as a guest, who might throw out a bit of, uh, you know, who might just stir it up a little bit with, with pointing out uh, the bullying uh, that's going on. Uh, but I don't hear it from politicians. I'm simply not hearing these arguments. I'm not hearing these criticisms. They must be heard. So we must join with others. And there is a growing, growing movement across Europe for, of Eurosceptic parties. And Eurosceptic is putting it rather mildly, I would say. Cont parties who, are, who can see and can clearly see what the European Union means for democracy and for liberty on this continent and who have started pointing it out. 
uh, and they are starting to gain ground. I suspect a large number of them are starting to gain ground because they are also critical of the open borders themselves and they are also critical of Islam. And this is the case, uh, this is why they are getting this following. Because these three issues are of paramount importance across this continent. The European Union first, because the European Union is the one allowing all this immigration, allowing the external border to be porous. And of course, if you've got a porous external border and no internal borders, you have no control whatsoever. Germany can open its border, and it's like Britain has opened its border, because nothing can stop them from coming from Germany. So we have this, this mass immigration, which is not coming from societies which we can easily get on with and easily integrate with. It is coming from largely Islamic societies. And if one is going to get to the root of why and is going to be brave enough to talk about that unwritten and unheard of and untold, that one they're all afraid of as to why this mass immigration is such a big problem, they're going to have to stalk, start talking about a certain religion and start talking about what it is bringing to Europe. It's not just the European Union. It's not just the immigration that it creates. It's the type of immigration that is coming. It's because of the European Union, and it is completely destabilizing us today, bringing terror, mayhem, and rape to our streets today, causing this massive backlash, and it will get worse, they, there's a reason they're trying to demonize those who protest, because they know that it's going to come, it's going to get worse and worse, and they want to nip it in the bud immediately by labeling these people, criminalizing these people. I remember the, after Cologne, uh, the, the, there was no police that night, and this is as, as clear as it gets, there were no police that night to protect the people. But a couple of days later, Pegida marched in protest through Cologne, and the place was swarming with police who used water cannon to wipe them off the streets. It has to, has to stop. The EU will continue, continue to tell us that it's the reason there's no war in Europe. I think it is bringing war to Europe. Oh, yeah. And that needs to be told to people as well. We won't sit around forever and take this. And I don't want this to happen. I don't want vigilantism. I don't want violence in the streets. But if this continues, that is, as night follows day, what's going to happen. And, we ha and it will be all the EU's fault. It's also a matter of, of tran you know, transient policy. Economies rise and fall. That's the nature of it. It twists and it turns. That is the nature of it. We have back and forward on policies like transport and health and education. Issues that will always be debated back and forward and policies will win or lose and we will have policies implemented. If you don't like them, if they don't work out, we can change it, we can go back, we can vote for someone else, you can vote for someone, if you don't like who you voted in this time, you can vote someone out else in next time. You can change the policy, you can change how things work, politics, the, the nature of democracy, the political debate going back and forward. This is not one of those transient issues. It's not something that twists and turns and goes back and forward and that we can vote to change again in five years' time. This is permanent. It's a civilizational issue and it will alter and has altered our civilization beyond recognition. And there's no turning back. There's no way we can suddenly, there's no easy way out of this now. We have a huge, huge, huge problem. And until we address it from every aspect and make sure that people understand that this is for good, this is permanent, we are bringing a society and a culture into Europe that will destroy who we are. It is already destroying our morals, our values. We already have... We're, 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 we don't even know who we are anymore. We're altering values, even our criminal law, at, to accommodate what the European Union is inflicting upon us. It is destroying our very, the very fabric of our civilization and our society. 
Now, I want us, I want for Britain to be at the very, very heart of this. Because the three issues that I mentioned, they are all connected, they are separate, but they're connected. They are the EU, immigration, and Islam. They are inextric inextric inextricably linked, as I said, and they are the reason, if you look again across Europe, they are the reason. Geert Wilders is the Eurosceptic voice in the Netherlands. He's now the second biggest party in the Netherlands. From nowhere, really, in a decade or so, he's now the leader of the second biggest party. He's the Eurosceptic voice in the Dutch parliament. He's also enormously, I don't know if you've noticed, critical of Islam. If you look at Marine Le Pen, who would have had it, she would have had it if they hadn't uh, tripped her up at the last minute. She is also the voice against the European Union, even though she's not necessarily against it, she's about as the most Eurosceptic you're going to get in France, in mainstream politics in France. She is also critical of Islam and immigration. It's not a coincidence. If you look at Hungary and Poland, they have no problem whatsoever calling out this cultural incompatibility. This is what's grabbing attention. This is what's making people sit up and listen because they know that Islam is, is an enormous, enormous problem. They know there's no religion of peace here. And that is getting their attention. And then when you have their attention, you remind them of why the continent is. It's not solely the fault of the EU. The British government is also to blame. Most immigration into this country uh, most years is actually from outside the EU. So that's the British government's fault. And if it's coming in from outside the EU, uh, unless it comes via Germany, we can't solely blame it on the EU. But the EU is determined to rid us of any ability to deal with these issues. Not only is it determined to give us perhaps hundreds of thousands, if not millions more. You can hear the, the number, the figure, millions being floated around. We have a 30-odd percent unemployment rate in Spain among young people. And yet Spain was told that it needed millions of migrants to make up its workforce. How can this be? This is, these are lies that are beyond any, you, know, you, you, kind of, you, you wonder, am I hearing this? Am I, who's crazy here, me or them? That's, you can't, the lies are so big and so obvious that you can't quite believe what you're hearing. You do not have a labor shortage such that you need millions of people. Millions of people, by the way, from societies which have a completely different educational standard from Spain, has a completely different economic uh, 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 machinery from Spain. And you know from experience, we know from experience, that all of those people who came to Germany, a million or more, in 2015, the vast, vast majority of them are not working. The vast majority of them are not going to be working. We also know that in Sweden, the, the age of retirement is going to go up. At least it's floated. The age of retirement was going to go up because they needed the tax to pay for the migrants. This while telling us that we need the migrants to pay for elderly people's pensions. We are being told the most extraordinary lies. And when someone is telling you those extraordinary lies, it's time to pick up your ears, Sit up straight, understand what's happening, understand that there's a power grab going on, a power grab from an unaccountable, unelected elite, and the power grab is against you. It's your power they're taking away. It's our power they're taking away. They genuinely, genuinely do believe that they know best. And you can see that contempt for the electorate over and over again. It's becoming the norm, it's becoming mainstream. And these extraordinary lies and this misuse of language, like the people's vote, there's no better example, or a, a Nobel Peace Prize for democracy in a, in a, for a body which continually and consistently ignores democratic vote. It's really quite obscene, but we are going to be at the heart of this. And the reason we're going to be at the heart of it is A, because we have different things to say, I want us to approach the European Union from a completely different point of view. I also want us to have a bigger um, a, and a, a vision for the future. What is our vision for the future? Do we get Brexit next March and then that's that? What's going to happen? What, is, what are we going to build now for the next generation and the generation after that? Because the society they live in will be determined by us now. 
And they either live in a totalitarianism, whether or not Brexit happens, or we get rid of it altogether, and it can be done. We want to offer, we want first of all to make people think about the EU differently and in the terms that I've just described, it's destroying us irreparably. But I also want us to think of a post-Europe, a post-EU Europe. If you're not aiming for something, something big, then you really, the, the, you, you, the drive disappears. There has to be a real vision at the end of this. What are we looking for? We are looking for the return of the European nation state. We are looking for a cooperation between European nation states where we will trade together, we will be friends and neighbours, we will cooperate on issues that are of common concern to Europe, but we will be a group of sovereign nation states working together for the betterment of the continent. But primarily within those nation states, we will work for in the best interests of our own people first. And we expect, of course we expect, every other country to do the same thing. That's what they should do. That's their job. And we will understand and respect that and we will compromise and we will work cooperatively in the best interests of our respective peoples. This is what we want. I also want to see some respect for European cultures. European cultures are old. They have shaped the world. We have given Europe as a continent, and this country in particular, has given the world immeasurable good. We have given the world ideas and concepts that uh, perhaps otherwise would not have been introduced to the world. Real liberties, real freedoms, such as things that have come out of, of Britain, uh, like a trial by jury, for example. The habeas corpus, the Magna Carta, the Magna Carta, which went on to form the basis or the model for the US Constitution. To me, today, the most important document in the Western world and something that is keeping a light on in the Western world for liberty. Also, of course, why it's being chipped away at by the left in the United States, who have already started, as I said, you, they drip these ideas into society, they drip them into political discourse, and the idea is being dripped into political discourse that the US Constitution is a white man's charter. And we all know what a white man's charter is, and that it must be gotten rid of, because anything done by the white man we know is unacceptable. And you can see it having this impact in the United States as well. A, a church I read about, I, this one stunned me, a church I read about in a southern state, I believe, which made it even more shocking, took down a bust of George Washington because it didn't want to cause offence. Now, when America, when anyone, it, it may happen only once or twice so far, but you can see the trajectory. You can see the way this is going. If an American Christian church is afraid to show a bust of George Washington in case it offends, you know that the America we know, the America we knew, is dismantling and it's going to disappear. With it, our freedom. The Americans have a brief respite in the shape of Donald Trump. He will, uh, no matter what one thinks about him, he, I quite like him, uh, he will protect the Constitution for as long as he's in office, I believe. And he will take the time, and I, I, I do think a second term is coming for him. I certainly hope a second term is coming, but I do think a second term is coming. And the good he can do in that time, by calling out the press, for example, is wonderful. But Europe doesn't have a Donald Trump. Uh, Europe has a group of countries which, in which people are attempting, trying their best to fight back and increasingly seeing this totalitarianism for what it is. Here in Britain, we have a very unique role in all of this. We have a unique role because it's Britain. And Britain has always been tougher and, and more resolute and the sort of, I mean, the, the Euroscepticism has always been so much higher here than across many European countries. And that's a very British thing. And it's that spirit that will take it, the whole thing down. I really do believe the spirit will take the whole thing down. We need a party in the UK that is at the heart of the three major issues that I mentioned. And it won't be enough simply to talk about Brexit. 
It won't be enough simply to talk about immigration. You've got to add the other one to get the people's attention and to get people to trust you. If you refuse to talk in absolute, straight down the line, straightforward terms about Islam, why should they trust you on anything else? If you are going to be politically correct about Islam, why should I trust you to tell the truth or to be robust or to be tough about anything else? The real one, the test of strength, the test of your guts. How gutsy are you? How, how determined really are you? Are you really going to take on the bullies of the European Union? Well, if I can stand and call Islam what it is, which is a violent religion of conquering, a conquering religion uh, of totalitarianism and fear, and that is what it is. If I will stand and repeatedly say that and never, ever back down, no matter how many threats, no matter how much money, no matter, I will never, ever back down on this issue. What that will tell the public is that this party can be trusted to go to the very, very edge of the line. There is nothing we won't take on. There is nothing that is true that we won't say. And there is no battle that we won't fight. I believe that this is the key to the door to get people moving to mobilise people, to motivate people, to incentivise people against the European Union is to tell them that they're destroying us, hugely by mass immigration from a culture that despises us and will dismantle us and will destroy us and is already raping and killing us in the streets. I do hope that you agree, I do hope that you can get on board and I do hope uh, that there's, there's a, 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 a vision for this party and the way to get that vision voted for is to get that message out. We have real difficulties of course because the media loathes us but that's not a bad thing because here's another one that's missing from political parties in this country. Millions and millions of people loathe the mainstream media, utterly, utterly loathe them. It's a huge, a large part of Trump's popularity is that he just takes them on and he's not afraid of them. And he still goes on Twitter and he still calls them all the names under the sun. And he said, it's fantastic. He, he hasn't changed a bit since he became president. I did. I expected him to, to tone it down a bit onto it. Not a bit of it. But he has taken on the media in a way that is crucial. People know the media is corrupt as hell. They know they're in the pockets of the politicians. If you, just to give you an example, is the Jordan Peterson and Kathy Newman video. If you haven't seen it, please do. Go on YouTube and put in Jordan Peterson and Kathy Newman. She, the, the smugness of her is typical of a mainstream journalist. But the way he dealt with it, he, he absolutely pull, pulled her up on everything. He silenced her for a few seconds. It was amazing. She had nothing at all to say. This, this is what we need as well. We need a party that will take them on. And the, this worrying, constant worrying about what tomorrow's headline will be. But realize a couple of things here. One, that you're letting the media dictate your policies. You're letting the media dictate who your party is. And the second thing you need to realize is that the mainstream media doesn't have the power it once did. One thing that I've been doing for years, and this is why I, I'm so convinced about public opinion on Islam, is reading below the line instead of above the line. And it's a very obvious thing for a politician who wants to understand or know what public opinion is read below the line. And what I mean by that is articles that are on the internet. So you'll have the article and below the line will be public comments. Read the public comments. Don't bother with the article. Obviously read it to see what it says, but to allow yourself to be guided in, in terms of policy but because of what a journalist says. I have yet to meet a journalist who has a clue about these issues. They think they're experts on everything, obviously. But I've yet to meet one who has a clue. And what I want and what I will do and what we will do, the moment will come, they can't ignore us forever. It will come. Mm -hmm. It's to take them on. Take them on. Pull them up on their hypocrisy, on their lack of knowledge of basic things. Make fools of them. 
the public will love it because they know, they know who these people are. This is what we need to do. We absolutely need to go right to the line on these issues. Not be afraid, to not be afraid because the people are on our side. All we have to do is get that message out and we will and we can. I'm, and this is my fourth, tonight I'll stay in my fourth hotel this week. This is how we're getting, we're doing it, we're doing it. And there are thousands of leaflets going out all over the country all the time. This is, a, we can, this is basic, nice, old school politics. I love it. I'm a big, big advocate of leafleting because there's nothing the media can do about it. It's fantastic. And the media, when they do come after us, will do what they think, you know, the smug arrogance, which is... Um, They'll call us, they'll, be, they'll pick out something they think is outrageous. Like she said, Islam is violent. And they'll print that, thinking it's going to destroy me. And the whole country agrees. And they, they don't, don't, don't get it. But it's time for Brexit. It's time for us to shout from the rooftops what the EU is and what it's doing to us. It must, Brexit must be the, the domino, the first domino, and then the rest will and must fall, because we will only restore freedom in Europe. We will only restore the European nation state and the European cultures which deserve respect, the ancient European cultures which deserve respect. We will only preserve them. We will only preserve our way of life. We will only preserve our ability to have freedom in our faith, in our philosophies, in our belief, if the European Union goes altogether. That has to be what we are, the vision that we are talking about. There has to be concern and consideration for the generation and the next generation and the generation after that. There must be a real fight back, but there must also be courage and belief. These are not buzzwords. They're the actual key. They're the key to all of this. You have to have the courage to go to the line, to say the unsayable, to stand your ground when they attack you. And you must also have the belief that we can emerge in a couple of decades time if not even sooner because things are really really speeding up now if not even sooner this creaking monstrosity in brussels which is swaying and creaking we can push it over with public opinion all over europe and when europeans truly understand when the when the scales fall from their eyes and they truly understand what this thing is they will move towards bringing it down i want us to be at the forefront of that. I think we can be, and I think we will be. I've been talking for an hour, so I'm going to stop. Shall we have a five minute break, Mike? And then we'll have some questions after that. But thank you once again, everyone, for coming along and for listening to me. And I'll see you for some questions in a few minutes. Thank you very much.